Places, everyone, places. so we can pray. <laughs> Lord, I just thank you for a good, good day. So I pray that this would be a, a day of worship. And Lord, I ask that you just allow us to set aside our thoughts, our distractions, and worries and cares and fears, and, and to come before you with a song and praise. We ask these things in your mighty name. Amen. 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 Would you please stand and join with us in our opening hymn, Seek Ye First. Is that, is that wise or foolish? Is that wise or foolish? Not to move in the mic. Oh, it's very wise. Very wise. It's, a, it's a question I used a lot in discussion with my boys growing up. Uh, we'd use it to talk about Bible characters, something that was done in a story. Could be talking about neighbor kids, friends, or their own behavior. Is that wise or foolish? A lot of our morning devotions were, we call them wisdom searches, but they were focused on Proverbs, and again, it was identifying wisdom, identifying foolishness. And you know, no one's ever said, you know, when I grow up, I'm going to be a fool. <laughs> I don't believe anybody said that, but some, some people have succeeded. <laughs> you know, Proverbs, Proverbs talks lots about foolishness and wisdom. But Jesus also spoke of that. Turn to Matthew 7, 24. Matthew 7, 24. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount. And when I read this, you're going to hear a little song in your head. Okay? Um, I'm going to push that out. But, uh, we, 
look at what it really says. Therefore, this is Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, if anyone hears, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The music started now. <laughs> and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house. Yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Now everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains fell and the floods came. The winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell. And great was its fall. Okay, this is kind of the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And these next two verses just summarize a lot. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority, not as their scribes. Um, how, does Jesus, how did Jesus define the wise man and the foolish man? Not really about where you build your house. If you look again, it says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man. You know, just hearing the truth. The foolish man heard the words as well, but he did not act on them. That's the difference. Uh, just hearing the truth isn't enough. Um, what does acts on Translations are used different verbs to describe that the person that does his work, the person that follows, that puts into practice or applies them. You incorporate them into your life or your behavior. Uh, everyone who hears these words of mine and applies them as the wise man. So let's let's continue to work on being wise men and women. Um, not just to withstand weather events. Blood's coming up and rain's coming up. Um, but just to encounter the problems that life throws at you, we're going to encounter them. These are the storms of life. And wisdom means that we're applying what we're hearing. We're going to hear some stuff this morning as Dan pre <coughs> preaches. Work on applying this. How does this apply to me? What can I do? What do I need to change? And then you can answer me. Is this wise or foolish? Um, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth in it. I thank you for the hope that we see and feel as we read your word. Lord, even in these turbulent, strange times, Lord, I, I pray for the peace, the comfort, the, the calm assurance that we're on the right path. I, I just thank you for what you provide. Lord, as we continue this time, I pray that this would be a, a time of worship, worshiping you in song, worshiping you in hearing your word and applying your word. And again, we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Would you please stand and join with us in singing, Take My Life.
Chapter 6 is where we're going to have, uh, where the message is coming from this morning. I'll explain why in just a sec. Thinking about Dennis's call to worship, I was always asked that question after I did something foolish. <laughs> now, was that right, or was that, was that foolish, or was that wise? Um, the, uh, the reason I'm in Acts this morning is I'm going to step away from pastoral responsibilities and chaplain responsibilities for a couple weeks, and I won't be in the pulpit, so I thought, I don't really want to go into chapter 8 and start that up without being able to come back. So I've had this message on my heart brewing for a few months now, and I, um, I want to go here today. So let me pray, and um, we'll, we'll go to the text. Father God, thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you for PCBC, Father. Lord, the, uh, the evidence of your grace in the lives of people, the testimonies that are in this building right now to the breaking through of the Spirit of God and the making new and being freshly born again to a living hope. God, we are the voices, the testimonies of the grace of God. And I pray, Father, that we would be vocal, but also, Lord, that our lives would reflect the fact that we have been changed. There's been a change. We have gone from death to life, and we have a risen Savior and a Lord and Master who gives us our marching orders, and what he says goes. Father, I pray for greater obedience in my life as a disciple of the Lord Jesus. And God, I pray that our time in your word this morning would be encouraging, frightening, and impacting, Lord, that we would come away, Lord, perhaps unsettled, and at the same time, completely settled. So be with us now, I pray, and ask this in Jesus' name. Before we jump, jump in, I just want to say, if you would, please pray this week. Um, the pastor's conference in Lobar, Kenya, is going on. It's this week, I believe. Right, Raj? Um, and uh, I wasn't uh, planning on doing it this week, or, or this, this year, regardless of the COVID stuff. I just hadn't planned on going. Um, but Pastor Tim and Pastor Mike were. And Tim went to the airport um, to fly out from California and was informed he had to have records of a past COVID test and it was not within the right time frame. On top of that, he had to quarantine for 14 days once he got into Kenya. So they turned him around and he's not able to go after all this preparation and desire to, to fly down there to teach. So by the grace of God and Zoom, he's still gonna be teaching just through video. Um, but my prayer is that God would richly bless, in spite of all of the weirdness this year, God would bless those pastors and their study. Okay, so we're going to be in Acts chapter 7 and 8 for the majority of our morning. But turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> we're going to look at Matthew 5, John 15, Matthew 10, and 2 Timothy. I'll call them out again. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed. If 
you're comfy underlining in your Bible or bluing in your phone, that word is key. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. John chapter 15, John chapter 15, verse 18 through 21. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on my account, or account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. Now, if you would, um, turn with me to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to the courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and father his child. And children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, if you turn to Acts chapter 6, we're going to be there for the majority of the rest of our time is 6, 7, and 8. As we've been walking through our study in Genesis and seeing uh, Noah and the ark, God's call to Noah, so on and so forth, we have seen the promises of God come true. <laughs> Over and over and over again. God promised it, says, I will do this, I will make covenant with you, and then perfectly satisfies it. Every time, God's record is, is spotless in his faithfulness to what he promises. And I have thought about this the last few months. This is a promise of God that we don't talk about very often, and that is a hard one, and yet is a true promise of God. All those who seek to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, rhetorical question, don't answer, but are you seeking to grow in godliness as you seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Then this promise is for you. 
you are promised from the word of God you will be persecuted. It doesn't say especially how or when or why or, or what all that looks like. We, you, you won't see it coming the way it comes typically. But nonetheless, the promise is there. And so this morning I want to look at the martyrdom of Stephen. And I want to see his reaction and his response to God's promises being fulfilled. God's specific promise being fulfilled. So first, who's Stephen? Acts chapter 6, 1 to 8. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. What we know about Stephen is, here's the apostles, and they're selecting quality men um, the word diakonos, deacon, is not necessarily here in the sense of they're getting formal deacons of the church, though that's really what they're doing. This would be, in my opinion, one of the first establishment of deacons in a local church. And as they look around, they have qualifications that they're interested in. They didn't say, well, who's bored? Or who wants to do it? Or, or who, who, uh, who, who is the person that is least or the most expendable who, who should we pick here no they say we want men of good repute and a man full of the spirit and of wisdom why well it gets sticky when you serve people if you walk in service to people you find yourself in all kinds of weird weird places that you have to be wise and filled with the spirit as we see here and so what do we know about Stephen's character? This man is full of the Holy Spirit, and he's a very wise man. Stephen, his name means crown, was chosen first as a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Stephen had, was known for his godly character. These leaders knew their men, and they knew, who do we want to do this job? So Stephen gets selected. God had been doing marvelous signs and wonders through Stephen who was full of grace and power. The picture painted is that of a very devoted, godly disciple of Christ. Our, our church, I'm not bragging, I'm bragging, praising God, but our church is full of people like this. Um, I remember, Dennis, when you started attending here, your statement was, there's a lot of really good men in this church. Um, and now there's one more, brother. But as, as the disciples, as the apostles looked over these men, they made a selection. And they picked this man, Stephen. Stephen is a waiter. Now this is what's so interesting is you say, so what's his job? Well, he's going to distribute food to widows. Really? And you want really high qualifications for that? Yes, I do. I want him full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom, and I want this person to become a particular servant of the church. And so this is what we know about Stephen. Now drop down to verse 9. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Great wonders and signs among the people. This is not your average waiter. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and those with, from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly, now this is key, beloved, don't miss this piece. They secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up 
huge word, false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. The word that, you, that you've got to get clear between your ears in reference to this mock trial is that this is absolutely disgraceful. This is false. These are lies. There, there's no true justice going on here. You know, the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. That is not taking place here. Do you see, guys, that what happened is Stephen was in conversation with them, giving a clear uh, explanation of his stance on truth. And he's going to do it again in chapter 7. They can't stop him intellectually. They can't shut his mouth in debate. And so either you, what, A, agree, or B, disagree and walk away, or see, make him look dirty, and then get him out of here. Now, the connections are so crystal clear. If you look at the trial of the Lord Jesus and the persecution of Jesus, this exact practice happened that is now happening here with Stephen. They lied about it. This isn't true. They, they told lies about him. They got people... I don't know how much, I don't know, it doesn't say that they paid them necessarily, but somehow they were able to get people to come forward, lie, and bear false witness before the crowd that Stephen was a horrific man, spitting on the Old Testament scriptures, denying what Moses had said, and saying that Jesus was going to destroy things, and um, they got the crowd going. Now, this is very interesting to me as a preacher. I, I've walked through this text before, but I have never walked through it when there were present riots taking place in our world. Now, it's fascinating to me, you guys, that you can look into your world right now and you can say, now, wait a minute. Could a few people really stir up a crowd to the point that they would start destroying property and actually go after and attack people? Could you really do that? Of course you can. Scripture's full of riots, as the book of Acts especially is full of riots. Your world presently is full of riots, with a spaghetti of mixed motives. Good luck distributing and figuring out why people are doing what they're doing. And so is it possible that there's great lies being stirred up about this man and a man who walks in godliness, full of faith, full of the truth of God's word, actually is going to be taken and given a bad name because of false accusations. Yep. That's exactly what will happen. Uh, a nephew of mine shared with me this week a point he had been chewing on, and I thought, that's exactly right. He, he said, you know... He said, when we receive harsh persecution in this country, and that happens, he said, we're not going to stand as the righteous ones with our heads up. We will be shamed in our culture. We will be seen as the dirty bad guys when we're persecuted for righteousness' sake. When you look at the murder of Jesus, and they get the entire crowd to scream, crucify him, you really have to make that man start looking bad in the eyes of the people. And here with Stephen, you have to get these folks to believe. Now, are these accusations true about Stephen? No. In part, maybe, in the sense of the Lord Jesus has come to change things, and the law is certainly going to be satisfied and fulfilled in Christ, and has been. But they're putting an edge, a spin on the truth with the desire to make him look like a dirty scoundrel worthy of a trial and potentially death. 
And so, beginning with Abraham. Now, guys, I'm not going to read through all of chapter 7 for time's sake this morning. Let me put on eyes and see what time it is. Oh, you know what? I am going to read it. It's got lots of time. All right. <laughs> Acts chapter 7. And the high priest said, are these things so? Stephen said, brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. Before he lived in Haran, and said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred, and go into the land that I will show you. Now, I want you just to jump with me through some different stories here. He begins with Moses. Remember, the accusation being made against him is the fact that he's against Moses. Drop down to verse 9. And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt, but God was with him and rescued him out of all his afflictions, and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. Now, this is brilliant what he does here. Okay? Now, in our context, if we were starting to be persecuted in this country in reference to um, us being wrong and going against the, the rules of the day and the law, and our response was, let, let me t tell you about Moses, it wouldn't be the same thing. But here, these are the religious leaders who have this authority and this power to put him to death. And so the wisest thing he could do is have a Bible study. And I will say that Acts chapter 7, if you take it, dissect it, meditate, memorize, is one of the greatest Old Testament flyovers that leads to Jesus you can get. Acts 7, I would argue, is one that should be mastered by every believer. Because this is the first martyrdom after the resurrection and ascension of the Lord Jesus. And this man who's about to be martyred shows us how the Old Testament is driving to this Christ to try to convince them and show them the truth of what's taking place before they murder him. I've always wondered, beloved, if after Stephen gave his case, if he had the slightest hope, I wonder who's listening, and I wonder what God's accomplishing with my word right now. I don't know. But as he goes from Moses, he goes through the patriarchs, verse 17, but as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. At this time, Moses was born. Now he explains as Moses comes and they go, and Moses leads them in uh, out of slavery and for 40 years are in the desert and the law is given. Verse 30, now when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses, as he drew near to look, there came the voice of the Lord, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. Now, at this point, guys, in this storyline, as Stephen's given this case, nobody's got a problem. Remember, the accusation up to here is this guy is a rebel rouser. He's causing all kinds of trouble. He's trying to destroy what we know to be true. Okay, Stephen, since you're going to represent yourself, what do you have to say? And he walks through the entire, uh, not the entire, but much of the Old Testament pivot points. And at this point, everybody there is nodding. There's no argument here. There's nothing here that they aren't aware of. There's nothing here that, that would bother them in the least. He's showing them he rightly interprets what's taken place in the history of their people. He's walking through the Old Testament scriptures saying, this is what happened, and then this is what happened, and then this is what happened. And all the crowd are sitting there going, okay, okay, yes, okay. Verse 41, and they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring me slain beasts 
and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel. You took up the tent of Moloch and the star of your god, Rephan, the images that you made to worship, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. Again, nobody has an issue here. Drop down to 48. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hands make all these things? Up to this point, no difference, no discrepancies, no bickering, no fighting. They're listening and he's saying the truth, you stiff-necked people uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did not your fathers persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not Keep it. Now, <clears throat> I have been, I've, I've been under a lot of preaching in my life so far, growing up as a kid, listening to sermons, I've listened to lots of preaching. Rarely does application come out like that, after an explanation of the Old Testament. Probably should more. But as he walks through there, he turns to them. Now, this is what's so interesting, you guys, because it's just like what Jesus did. Jesus consistently gave an exposition of the Old Testament and then drew a direct line to the Pharisees and the scribes and said, but it's you. You're the ones. To the point that he got so hardcore and just said, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. And then gave a litany of all the hypocrisy of their life. This is very much what Stephen is doing. Stephen is unfolding the Old Testament and then looking at these people and saying, the history of our people are people who are stiff-necked, people who are uncircumcised of heart. In other words, they're dead in, in spirit. They're, they are spiritually off. And you are no different. You are exactly the same way, Stephen is saying, to these people. Now, here's what's interesting to me. In Acts chapter 2, Peter uses rough language, not as rough, but much like this. And it says they were cut to the heart. What must we do to be saved? And you see a mass conversion. What happens to Stephen? Look, look down at your Bibles. Verse 54. When they heard these things, they were enraged. And they ground their teeth in him. How angry does one need to be to grind their teeth? You ever ground rhetorical? Have you ground your teeth in anger before? Where you found yourself so angry that you literally ground your teeth knowing what was deep in your heart was sin and strong, hot anger. Beloved, I'll make a statement that I believe to be true. I think some of the hottest anger we experience is when we're convicted of our own sin. Now, by God's grace, as believers, he convicts us of our sin. We, we're angry. We're defend, we, we try to defend ourselves. And then God, in his grace, smooths you out a little bit. Wait a day. Wait a couple days. For some of us, wait a couple weeks. And that anger starts to become, okay, <laughs> you're right. I did do that. And the reason I did that was because I had a sinful inclination and my heart was like that. Conviction of sin produces anger. Because we hate that. We hate the taste of conviction. And by God's grace, that hatred turns into love. I call it sweet pain, where in that conviction is hard, 
but God in his grace is growing you, maturing you, blessing you, helping you to the point where you say, oh, I'm so grateful God loves me enough he would bring conviction into my life. That's the believer's reaction. Thank you, God. Thank you, you brought this person into my life, this song into my life, this text into my life. Somehow, you brought this conviction of my sin to my attention. I praise your name for that. Hebrews chapter 12, a godly parent disciplines his children. But what happens to the believer when they feel a slight prick of the soul? Conviction of sin, and it's been shown to be something that took place. It reminds me of the story R.C. Sproul told years ago where Billy Graham and a group of other people were golfing, and they golfed, um, I forget if it was 18 holes or not, but they, they had a big golf game and they came back, and one man was so angry, he grabbed a bucket of balls and he just started beating those balls as hard as he could, just sending them down, just so angry. And a friend came over and goes, what's the problem? What's the matter? He said, I don't need Billy Graham shoving religion down my throat. And he walked away and just started beating those balls even harder and harder. And then finally he just kind of did a sigh and walked away. And his friend came over and goes, so Billy was pretty hard on you. He said, no. No, I just had a bad game. <laughs> <laughs> now he can say that. But when there's a true wound, and you being salt get near the wound, you usually get the, uh, the reproach. Did you notice, guys, how many times in Jesus' warnings it said, for my name's sake, on my account? It's not a matter of they hate you because of you. <coughs> if you love the world, the world would love you. The more you are not of the world, the more the world can stand you. To the point that this young man has shut the mouth of everybody and the only thing left is to be converted or to kill him. Look at verse 54 of chapter 7. Or 55. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. I don't know exactly what that means or exactly what he saw, but he knew what it was. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Please don't miss that. Um, my dad has pointed this out to me that most of my life, that every time you see Jesus at the right hand of God, he's always what? Sitting at the right hand of God. This isn't a bad translation. This isn't a mix-up on the words. He was standing. And, you know... Preachers and people want to run amok with that. I don't know all that that means, but my thought is that there is certainly an action on the Lord Jesus seeking to bring encouragement to Stephen in the midst of the darkest hour, yet becomes the brightest hour, that he sees Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of the Father, awaiting. Now, does God have to do that? Has every martyr seen that? No, no, I, I, I don't think so. But um, let, me, let me take a side step here real quick. I think this is important. Has anybody ever posed the question to you before, if you were to ask to deny Christ or not, what do you think you'd say? People ask that question sometimes, and they do it as a, as a way of, of trying to say, well, they want to stir you up and say, so if they held a gun to your head today and they said, deny Christ or I'm putting a bullet in there, what would you say? And you go, well, I, I, this is the usual answer. I hope I would stand for Jesus. And we've seen this happen. This mar the, 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 the history of the church is extremely bloody with the blood of the martyrs. It's the seed of the church. But I don't think it's a fair question. One thing I've learned about the Lord is the Lord is very kind and gracious and gives us what we need in the moment of the need. And so I believe that God, in his grace, in that moment, gave Stephen courage, strength, and spiritual sight to endure. Just in the same way, your neighbor comes over and your neighbor says, I know you're religious. Can you share a little bit with me about what you guys do at the whole churchy stuff? 
And in that moment, you speak and you share with them. And after they leave, you go, I don't know where those words came from. It just, I felt full of the Spirit of God and the words came. And I got to tell somebody what just happened. Do you think the Lord would give you and grant you the strength and the eloquence to speak his word in the moment by his grace? Absolutely. Absolutely he would. And so why would we think that God would let Stephen sit there and just shake in fear and not give him what was needed in the heat of the moment for the sake of Christ? Now, what this does, beloved, what this does is that as you and I look down the pike and we say, persecution is coming, what am I going to do? This is where we have to find ourselves at ease in our trust that the Lord will provide all the time and in that moment. So rather than the men being convinced, they were convicted and they were profoundly angry. The word enraged means to be filled with ang anger. We use that term sometimes, the phrase will say, I was boiling over. They ground their teeth out of pure rage and violent anger. This grinding comes from the idea of a wild beast eating loudly. That's where that word is coming from. The picture is like a pack of wolves snarling and grinding their teeth just before they devour their victim. Stephen, at this point of his coming death, is gracious and granted the ability to see the resurrected Christ standing in heaven. Throughout Scripture, Jesus is typically sitting, and here he is standing. Stephen, when he responded and told them, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart, you who always resist the Holy Spirit, just as your fathers did, so do you, and you crucified the Messiah when he came onto the scene. Made them so angry because they knew his biblical interpretation was crystal clear. And they could do nothing about it. And when they looked at him, it says his face looked like the face of an angel. I don't know exactly what that means. I think the, what's being communicated is very simply, there's nothing they could draw against this man. He wasn't spitting at them. He wasn't causing, saying any profanity. He wasn't fighting. He wasn't egging them on. He was gentle of heart, clear in his ex explanation of the text, and clear in the truth of their sin and the conviction of their sin before Almighty God, to the point they had no response. And so in anger, you see a mob develop, and they go after him. Now, I don't want to be too graphic. But I want to give you an idea of what a typical stoning would look like. <coughs> what they did is they would take the individual. They would tie their hands behind their back. They'd throw him over kind of a cliff into a pit. And then roll him over if he was still alive. And then they would drop heavy rocks on his chest. Now, if that did not take the life, they would invite the crowd to come in and everybody who was watching. So just the witnesses got to be the ones to do it at first. That's why it says that they went to go take off their clothes. Remember, they're in the, the east and it's hot. It's a sweaty business. So they're going to take off their, their jacket and their shirts and, and then they're going to go to work. And if that doesn't take the life of Stephen, then they invite the rest of the people. Now, that's the typical. This one seems more mobbish than organized. So what exactly all took place here? I don't know. I don't know if they threw him down, if they bound him. I don't know exactly what all of that looked like. But regardless, they were all in agreement. This boy will die today. Seeking to kill someone with rocks in the Middle East. We really get a good idea of just how reckless this was due to the fact that the Greek word used by Luke for rushed is the same word used for the herd of swine that charge over the edge after they're filled with demons. This is just reckless. Luke, get him and take his life. In a very Christ-like fashion, Stephen commits his spirit to God. Look down at the, at the text with me. Um, verse 58. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. 
And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Do not hold this sin against them. Supernatural is the only word that comes to mind in reference to this kind of a response to a murder. A wrongful death where the leaders of that day took this young man and murdered him before the crowd with everybody bloodthirsty with no evidence, no proof, except for false lies about what he did, which he never did. Now stop and consider that moment. This handsome young man is covered in his own blood, lying dead on the ground. The adrenaline is coming down in the mob, and the witnesses wipe away their sweat and get dressed. This was the first Christian martyr, illegally murdered by an act of violent, mindless brutality. Can they stop here? Now this is the interesting part. Can, is it over? Okay, we killed Stephen. Done. This group of people, this strange cult, the people of the way that they call themselves, these people, we're, we're now done with them. We've done away with him. Everybody can watch. You want to follow Jesus? That's what happens. Nobody's going to follow Jesus. Look at chapter 8. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose in that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now, if you walk through the rest of chapter 8... And then come to chapter 9, you will see there is still mass conversions of people getting saved. Beloved, I am convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt with all of my heart, the best way to see the church grow is to seek to hurt her. Persecution grows the church. The death of the church is when the church is never persecuted and given everything she wants. Just walk through your Old Testament and ask the question, when is Israel closest to the Lord and when are they furthest away? How quick are they to start to develop their own idols? Moses goes up on the hill and they say, Aaron, make us this, this statue. Show us this God. And then Moses comes down. And one of the silliest portions of the Old Testament is Moses goes, yeah, we threw it in the fire and calf came out. Golden calf. And it's amazing, isn't it, Moses? The idolatry of the people of God lurks around the corner all day, every day. Persecution accomplishes a task in the Christian that nothing else will. And the greatest missionary, one of the greatest missionaries in the history of the church... The, had the coats at his feet of the people who slaughtered Stephen. We're told in the start of chapter 8 that Saul was in full approval of Stephen's death and that a great persecution started on that very day against the church in Jerusalem. The effect that this persecution had on the church in Jerusalem was that it was scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Saul was ravaging the church, seeking to destroy and making havoc. Now remember, the, uh, Paul's a very thoroughbred in the sense of he's a Pharisee, he's from the tribe of Benjamin, he's a, a scribe, he's brilliant, he's strong, he's powerful, and he's above every of uh, all of his uh, colleagues and his leadership and in his passion to do away with this church. Everything in him wants it, wants to destroy it. From the world's standpoint, now, think of this through with me. From the standpoint of the world watching, it would be very clear that this movement would soon be destroyed and forgotten. 
If you were to ask some of the people that witnessed the stoning of Stephen, if you went over and go, how long do you think this Christian thing is going to last? Well, if they do that to all the Christians, nobody's going to follow this Jesus. Because remember, Jesus is dead. He didn't rise. This is the propaganda that's going around. This is what's on the media. He didn't rise. He, he's dead. The disciples actually went and took his body and they hid it so that way they could spread the lie that he rose. But he really didn't rise. But they're trying to get this movement going. But if we kill him, that will stop the movement in its tracks. I don't think this is going to last very long at all. What's God's perspective? Look at it from the perspective of the Lord. Now, what is God accomplishing in this time of persecution? And beloved, I am convinced this is the thought pattern of the believer. It should be. Where we see the world, and we look at the world, we watch the news, or we talk to our neighbors, we see the world, and we go, ay, 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 ay this place is going crazy, and it's destroying itself as fast as it can. And we find ourselves overwhelmed, we find ourselves kind of discouraged, a little bit melancholy. We go, man, what happened? What happened? Step over here and ask the question, okay, but what is God accomplishing in the midst of this? I just read to you one of the worst, brutal slaughterings of a Christian in the history of the church. Let me remind you of a few facts. Number one, Stephen will never, ever endure the pain of this world again. Stephen is in the presence of Jesus for all eternity, where he has absolute fullness of joy and no physical pain for the rest of his existence for eternity. God is setting the stage for Saul's conversion to Christ. Now imagine this. I don't think this is the case, but imagine if somehow God communicated to Stephen during his martyrdom. See the guy over there with the coats at his feet, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands will come to Christ from his preaching and from his writing. The Christians who viewed the murder saw a strong witness for Jesus. Everybody's scratching their head going, why didn't he give up? What is, what is wrong with him? Why didn't he just give up? What is happening in the heart and soul of that kid that he would endure this? Through the persecution, the evangelistic endeavor was pushed out to the regions of Judea and Samaria. Turn with me to Acts chapter 1 really fast. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. The Lord Jesus, before his ascension, says this. I want you to turn there because I want you to see this with your eyes and your Bible. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Notice, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Case in point, what would it take to kick him out of Jerusalem and get him moving into Judea and Samaria? Chapter 8. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Beloved, through the persecution, the evangelistic endeavor was pushed out to the regions of Judea and Samaria, fulfilling the exact statement made by the Lord Jesus at the top of this whole thing. Most likely, now this is where I want to do a catch-all really quick, most likely God is accomplishing, was accomplishing, a thousand other things that I have no idea about in the midst of this persecution. Through this one event, God was sovereignly accomplishing thousands of things for his glory and for the good of his people. 
The persecution of God's people does not happen for nothing. There is a magnificent plan behind these events that will ultimately result in the joy of God's people in his great glory. This does not mean that there is not great physical and emotional suffering at times. I'm not saying the pain doesn't hurt. But the Christian finds his and her peace of the soul by resting in God's sovereign care and divine providence. And so, I am forever and forever amazed by the apostles in the book of Acts after they had been beaten and released. Rejoice that they were considered worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. That's a supernatural act in the soul of a human being. To be maligned, lied about, persecuted, harmed, and walk away saying, I'm enduring the suffering of Jesus Christ for his name's sake. This is a hard sermon because if I were to give this message in other parts of our world and there was somebody present whose children had been taken away from them because of their faith or someone whose wife was beheaded in a church service the day before, it may touch the heart faster because we have it easy. Our country is an anomaly when it comes to this promise from the Lord. And so, my encouragement at PCBC is that as it comes, remember the Lord is fulfilling his promise that we will suffer for his name's sake. He's faithful to his promise. Let us be careful to Accept that which the Lord may grant into our lives for his glory, regardless of the cost. And hold our lives with a loose hand, ready for him. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the, the truth that is here. Just how counterintuitive this is, and how different, Lord, it is from what we know to be our own experience most days of the week. Lord, we have a high, high accountability. As one person said, it is very, very hard to be a solid Christian in America. Because we love our idols. So, Lord God, I pray that you would, whatever instruments you use, I pray you draw us closer. That, Father, we would see that there is nothing this life can afford that comes close to our nearness to our God. Father, when that day comes, I pray that we would remain faithful that you would preserve us and have us speak clearly the truth of Christ, knowing, Lord, that he is our great and glorious Redeemer. And I pray for our persecuted brethren in other lands this morning who are meeting in fear, but also in great hope. For those who have suffered, who are mending wounds on their body for Jesus this morning. Father, I pray you preserve your church in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand and join with us in singing our holy hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. <clears throat> Thank you, God.